Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Dana Suskin, co-director of the TMW Center for Early Learning and Public Health and director of the Pediatric Cochlear Implant Program at the University of Chicago. For those of you all who aren't familiar with the TMW Center, we're an interdisciplinary research institute that advances a novel public health approach to preventing early cognitive disparities. In order to achieve impact at scale, we develop and test evidence-based interventions and tools. We partner with communities, and we use science as a cornerstone of our work. Our work focuses on the powerful role that parents and caregivers play in enhancing children's foundational brain development. That belief in the power of parents is just one of the many reasons that I am so excited to be here today with my great friend, Dr. Perry Class, to discuss her new book, a good time to be born. Before we begin, though, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. First, you should be able to see the presenters, me and Perry, but unfortunately, we aren't able to see you. So if you want to ask a question, please take advantage of the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll be pulling questions from the Q&A near the end of the event, so please, please get those questions in. I also want to take a moment to recognize the two co-presenting organizations who have helped make it this evening possible. The Becker Friedman Institute for Economics serves as a hub for cutting edge research across the entire University of Chicago economics community, which TMW is honored to be part of. Special thanks to BFI's Pamela Carpenter and my wonderful colleagues at TMW, Liz Savlich and John Wenger, who have made tonight possible. Thanks, too, to the Seminary Co-op Bookstore for providing tonight's book sales. Seminary Co-op stores are the first non-for-profit bookstores whose mission is book selling. So if you don't yet have a copy of this amazing book, A Good Time to Be Born, you can click on the link in your screen and go directly to the Co-op website. And now let me introduce my dear friend, Dr. Perry Class. Perry is Professor of Journalism and Pediatrics at NYU, co-director of NYU Florence, where she is currently uh, up in the middle of the night to be with us, and medical director of Reach Out and Read. Perry has written extensively about medicine, children, literacy, and even reading. Perry's work has been featured in the New York Times, where she writes a weekly column, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, the New England Journal of Medicine, and many, many other outlets. For her powerful journalism, the American Academy of Pediatrics awarded Perry with the Arnold P. Gold Foundation Humanism in Medicine Award, citing the impact that she has made through her writing, service as an educator, and leadership in promoting early literacy through Reach Out and Read. Perry's most recent book, A Good Time to Be Born, How Science and Public Health Gave Children a Future, is about public health's fight against child mortality. She tells the story using her own experience as a medical doctor and a student, medical student, and by documenting the groundbreaking female physicians, public health officials, and scientists who work to change the very way we think about family. And I have to say that it has been one of the most uplifting things I have read in 2020. It deeply resonated with me as a physician, and a public health advocate, but most importantly, as a mother. Perry, you have reminded us, as your book so eloquently notes, that we are the luckiest parents in history. I cannot wait to dive in and discuss. But first, I'd like to turn it over to Perry, who's going to start us off with a reading from the book. Thank you so much, Dana. I just want to say what a pleasure and an honor it is to be here and to talk about this topic and children's welfare with my friend and colleague and child advocate heroine, Dr. Dana Suskind, and to be supported in this by her wonderful organization. It's really a pleasure. It's really an honor. And I'm going to read to you from the beginning of, of my book and then Let's talk. Our grandparents and great grandparents and all the parents before throughout history expected that children would die. It was a known and predictable risk that went along with being a parent. Now, we expect children not to die. We are the luckiest parents in history. 
we who are part of this wave over the past 75 years or so, because we are the first parents ever who have been able to enter into parenthood in the hopeful expectation of seeing all our children survive and thrive. And we are also the luckiest children in history, born into an era when we could expect to grow up along with all our sisters and brothers. Driving down child mortality in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was in no way a single project, but it can be seen as a unified human accomplishment, maybe even our greatest human accomplishment, at least for pediatricians and parents. The entire world has relearned with some shock and great sorrow how vulnerable our precious human bodies are to the microorganisms that find ways to take advantage of how we live, what we eat, how we travel. Parents have taken some comfort in knowing that for the most part, children have been less severely affected by COVID-19, but all through human history, babies and children have been a particularly vulnerable group and parents have lived with the fear of contagion, infection and death. Children used to die regularly and unsurprisingly, babies died at birth or soon after because they were premature or just weak, because they were born with congenital anomalies, because they got infections. Older infants and one-year-olds died of summer diarrhea, often caused by microbes in the water or in the cow's milk they had started drinking after they had been weaned. Three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five and six and seven and eight-year-olds died of scarlet fever and diphtheria and pneumonia and measles, of skin infections that turned into sepsis or influenza that turned into pneumonia. As recently as the late 19th and early 20th centuries, almost every family in every ethnic group and every country, rich or poor, was touched in some way by the death of children. Childhood death was always there in the shadows at the edge of the family landscape, in prayers and religious ceremonies, in the, in the memorial portraits hanging on the wall, in popular sentimental poems and sorry, stories and dramas and paintings. Because they figured so consistently in childhood and family life, child deaths also figured in the art and literature and songs and stories of childhood and family life from a century ago, as they had all through human history. I am a lover of babies, and yet I can't seem to have them, wrote Mrs. W.D. from Brooklyn in 1917. I am married 11 years last July and would have six children, and I'm about to become a mother again, which I almost fear. I have now but two out of six, one boy nine years and one six years. Two of them had apparently died some years ago. She didn't say how, but then within a year she had two babies, and she ended up losing both of them. I gave birth to a beautiful fat boy and it lived but three days, she wrote. The doctor told her the baby had a leaking heart. Three months later, she was pregnant again. The son lived to be a year old. And then she awoke one morning and found him dead alongside of me. Now pregnant again, she worried constantly both about the terrible long labor she was likely to endure and about what would become of the baby. I try and live a good, honest life, she wrote, and my home is my heaven and babies are my idols. I love them, but I am afraid something will happen to this one again. She was writing this letter to the United States government, to the Children's Bureau, established in 1912. This new federal office had published the pamphlets Prenatal Care in 1913 and Infant Care in 1914, which were immediately and enduringly popular. By 1929, the government had estimated that these writings had touched the parents of half the babies born in the United States. Mothers responded eagerly, sending more than 125,000 letters a year to the Bureau with their questions and their stories. You can think how I feel, Mrs. W.D. wrote to the author of the pamphlets. I cry night and day for my big fat baby taken from me like that. Mrs. W.D. was not living in the Middle Ages or even in the Victorian era. She was living in 1917 when my grandmother lived and in New York City where my grandmother lived 
10 years before my own parents were born. And at that time in 1917, when Mrs. W.D. wrote her letter, nearly a quarter of the children born alive in the United States died before their fifth birthdays. The mothers wrote in those early decades of the 20th century with a certain hope for medical solutions, for advice that might protect the next baby, and even with a desire to extend that protection to all babies and children, to join in the larger project the Children's Bureau and its pamphlets represented. I only wish I could take up the work of promoting baby welfare, wrote one woman who had lost her child in Illinois. By the time I was training in pediatrics in the 1980s, there was no such thing as routine or unavoidable infant and child mortality. Short of very rare and terrible diseases, almost every death was supposed to be preventable and prevented. The vaccines of the 1950s and 1960s, polio, measles, were augmented with new vaccines to prevent diseases that were deadly but much rarer, such as the life-threatening infections caused by Haemophilus influenza type B. And advances in neonatology had made it possible to save sick newborns who did not breathe, breathe promptly in the delivery room and to keep tiny premature infants alive. We would go through our medical training without ever seeing a case of diphtheria or polio. Those battles had been won. Instead, we would set our sights on eliminating SIDS, on making sure infants were properly strapped into car seats. Pediatric oncology offered a 90% cure rate, even on the scariest ward. Pediatric cardiology could save all but the most severe congenital heart defects. There were still battles to be won, but we had begun to see a world our grandmothers could not even have imagined, in which there was an implicit promise that if parents took the right precautions, every child could be expected to live to grow up. And it was our obligation as pediatricians to help make the world even safer. Thank you, it gave, it gave me chills. This is what I wrote when I read it um, on the page. Um, as I mentioned, I was, when I began this book, I would have never imagined a book about the fight against infant mortality would be so uplifting, really hopeful. And I know that um, it almost feels like an antidote to what's going on today in our country. And I know that you couldn't have imagined what is happening in 2020 when you started it, um, but it's almost no. a a lesson. What, what, what made you write this book and, you know, what are the lessons for today? Well, of course, when I started writing it, and I've been obsessed with this for a number of years, of course, I couldn't imagine what we're going through right now any more than any of us could, even, even a year ago. But what I do, and I came to write the book partly because I was thinking about how far we've come in that near century since my grandmother's moment in the early 20th century, and even more in the century and a half that takes you back a little further into the 19th century. It's so close. We're so close to a time when if you went around a table um, in the best, fanciest, poshest circles or in the poorest families, everybody would have lost a baby or lost a sibling or lost a schoolmate. It's so close. So that was kind of where the book came from. It was thinking about how far we'd come. But I think that one of the lessons for us right now is a little bit of a lesson to have faith in our ingenuity as humans, to have faith in science, to have faith in public health, to believe that we actually have the capacity as human beings to eliminate certain, certain miseries, including miseries that have been with us all through our history. Smallpox was a, a misery that had been with humans for centuries, longer, longer. Um, epidemic tuberculosis, right? You'll, you find it in mummies in Egyptian tombs. These are things which had been causing pain and misery and blighting families and creating tragedy. And 
in a variety of interconnected projects as humans, as scientists, as public health workers, as parents, as advocates, as legislators, we put it together and we stop them. And I think that should give us a little bit of hope right now, even as we figure out how to find our way in the sort of sudden disorientation of a, of a new pandemic. So, so if you, if Dr. Perry Class III, you know, a hundred years from now is writing the book, looking back at COVID, will, will she be able to write such a positive, hopeful, uplifting narrative? You know, or is it that you were able to smooth over the edges to getting to where we are in terms of infant mortality? And will we be able to have the same? What, what do you think history will, will be able to tell us about today? I know you don't have a magic uh, ball, but uh, yeah. So one of the things that I came away from after researching this book was a deep and profound appreciation of the heroism of parenthood. Um, parents all through those centuries who undertook this really fraught assignment of loving children, taking care of children, tending children, but living with, you know, I mean, spare a thought for what it meant when mommy, I have a sore throat meant possibly diphtheria, which was untreatable, possibly scarlet fever in the era before antibiotics, right? Parents are kind, have a certain amount of grit and heroism. So when we think about the story of the COVID pandemic, yes, there will be scientific heroism and public health heroism and frontline heroism of many kinds, but there's also a kind of day by day persistent nobility that goes with parenthood that I hope we don't lose sight of. And that's, you know, true, even though, again, the children are not the ones who are most liable to be, you know, to severe illness right now, but the parents who are managing the teaching, managing the working from home, juggling all of these new worries, and at the same time, taking a little time and thought to create a certain kind of security, a certain kind of memory, a certain kind of, you know, sense of being a family together. That's a heroism all to itself. It's, a, it's almost more of an insidious impact on children these days, um, but I think no less profound for sure. But I do, you know, going back to the heroism of parents, the narratives, the intimate narratives that you weave were just, uh, they were heart wrenching and sort of showing the universality of parent loss and parent love. I mean, even, I don't think one historical giant wasn't dis described from Du Bois to Darwin to Lincoln. What were your? Can you share some of your favorite stories and talk about a little bit about Dink, uh, um, Dickens? Because I was really disappointed in him as a father. I would not. <laughs> I would want Darwin as my father. Dick, Dickens, not so much. Can you tell, share a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, you're absolutely right. That is to say, um, this infant and child mortality touched every single, almost every family. Um, I, um, Darwin, who lost his beloved daughter, Annie, to probably some combination of possibly scarlet fever, maybe with other infections um, on top of that, who tended her lovingly um, and wrote to his wife. He took her to a town where there was a doctor who was supposed to be able to cure her, and he documented the nursing and the tending. But one of the things that I found so fascinating about it is that in, in all his tender care for her and in all his hour-by-hour -hour records, he's not shocked or surprised that he has a beloved, you know, 10 year old and that she's got an illness and that there's nothing that can be done. That's just the way things are. And then he, he corresponds as part of his voluminous scientific correspondence with Hooker, who's a botanist, and then later with Huxley, another evolutionary biologist. And he's advising them that when their children die, yes, it's very hard on the anniversary every year. Yes, that's a, a great sorrow. But it, he doesn't ever say, 
science should be able to stop this. It should not happen. That's just too much a part of life. Now, Dickens, you come to Dickens because Dickens, of course, is particularly good at creating um, pathetic childhood death scenes. And when he writes The Old Curiosity Shop, he creates the you know, blameless and um, much persecuted Little Nell. And Little Nell, it's a serial novel. He's writing it episode by episode. And Little Nell famously wastes away in this cruel world from chapter to chapter to chapter. And I was actually brought up on the famous legend that when the magazine with the next installment was coming over on the boat from England, people would come down to the docks and yell out to the sailors and ask them, you know, how little Nell was doing. And, you know, she wastes away in her life. It's a, just a the classic 19th century um, drawn out death of the innocent, blameless, lovable child. And Dickens, oh, he, he milked it for everything it was worth. And he, you know, recorded in his diary, um, you know, I've gotten so many letters today begging for mercy for poor little Nell, but it cannot be, I'm slowly murdering her. Anyway, Dickens and his wife had 10 children, and he clearly knew everything about all of the illnesses which could strike children down in the nursery. Um, and when their infant daughter, Dora, who was named after a character in one of his books, which was something that he liked to do, when Dora died suddenly, his wife was away also getting medical treatment. And so he decided to break the news to her that their baby had died by writing a series of letters. First, he wrote to her that she, that little Dora is suddenly stricken ill. Mind, I will not deceive you. I think her very ill. So he urged his wife to come home. But, and this was the thing I thought was so striking, he warned her, we can, we never can expect to be exempt as to our many children from the afflictions of other parents. In other words, he was telling her, remember, everybody loses children. And then eventually he'll tell her that their daughter is dead. You, you, you allude to the fact that there are, there are disparities in child mortality then as there are now. Um, do you think they're less, they were less documented at that time, or were people aware of it as they are now? I think people were aware of it, although the question of when people begin counting and how they count is one of the really interesting topics in this history. Because what we count now when we talk about infant mortality, as you know, is we mean out of every thousand live births, how many of those children don't make it to their first birthday. So if we say that the um, infant mortality rate in the United States nowadays is between six and seven, we mean that between six and seven children out of a thousand, in other words, less than um, one out of a hundred, don't live to that first birthday. In order to get that statistic, you've got to count all those live births urban, rural, rich, poor. And in the 19th century, when most babies are being born at home, it's not clear that people are counting generally. Births are not necessarily being registered. If children don't live very long, if they don't make it out of the delivery room, if they're very premature, if they never really start breathing, it's not clear that anybody is necessarily registering them. You, you find out um, often, you, you go back through, say, parish registers to see who's christened, to see, you know, but you don't necessarily have a, that denominator. And that makes it very hard to make comparisons, especially in poor populations, especially in rural populations, especially in marginalized populations. But from everything we know, and there's been some really interesting sort of historical demography done to try to go back and recreate what the infant mortality rates say are among African-American populations in the second half of the 19th century, the, more t there are, the disparities are there. The mortality rates are higher in the African-American population. They're higher in the immigrant populations as people start um, immigrating to the United States in large numbers. Um, they're, high, they're very high in some cities where people are living crowded together under difficult circumstances. 
but they're also pretty high among privileged populations. They're higher among the poor, nutritional status is worse, um, people are living under uh, worse conditions. But for example, um, in the early years in the United States, somebody did collect mortality figures for physicians and the mortality rate for the children of physicians was a little better than the general population but not that much better. Yeah. I mean, do now, you think the... Saying, sorry. No, 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 continue, continue. I was gonna say, as you were saying, we still have disparities. The infant mortality rate and the maternal mortality rate in this country still are um, significantly higher in the African-American population, um, in the American Indian Alaskan Native population. Those disparities, although the actual numbers are much, much better than they were for any population 100 years ago, those disparities um, persist and they, they require, they're, they're, they require really fixing serious wrongs and inequities in order to address them. Yeah, yeah. Do you think the fact that it was such a universal scourge resulted in sort of more attention to it. Uh, you know, this this affected everyone and we took a public health approach to it. Um, I find actually, the, the real question is, I find it really interesting that so many of the things that you described, the Shepherd Towner, the milk stations, the Children's Bureau, the home visiting, they're universal public health approaches that Today, people would say you're tiptoeing into universal health care. I, I find that really interesting. Why didn't it become universal in, in the way that European countries sort of took it up? Do you have thoughts on that? And why have we pushed it away so much? Well, I mean, we come closer to feeling a responsibility to provide universal health care for children probably than we do with adults in this country. We, you know, we do, we do feel collectively some responsibility for children's health care. We do have programs, um, vaccines for children and, and CHIP that extend coverage more broadly to children. But you're right, in some very profound way, we missed an opportunity. As we missed an opportunity to provide um, parental leave, which pretty much every other wealthy country, industrialized country mandates in some way, and we don't. Um, you know, the paid parental leave after, after a child is born, which was from the very beginning aimed at making sure that babies could be breastfed, that babies could be cared for. Um, we've, so on the one hand, I'll, I'll say this for our field, for pediatrics, as a field, it's a, sort of the thinking about the social determinants of health, thinking about social responsibility for babies is a little bit built in to American pediatrics, more than it's been necessarily built into the rest of the healthcare. And I would credit um, some of the founders of pediatrics, people like Abraham Jacoby, who actually was a, a revolutionary coming over from Germany, but also just the basic truth that everyone who does pediatrics knows, which is that a baby doesn't walk into your office alone. A baby is carried into your office by parents, by a family, and if the family is not able to manage, then the baby's not going to do very well. Yeah. So, you know, in that, I mean, we're both in medicine. I'm on the surgical side, but I feel more like a pediatrician. I found this story about the Shepherd Towner Act and that the American Medical Association um, help sort of prevent it from <laughs> being reestablished. And maybe you could describe what it is and that story if you want to. Um, I, I was sure. taken aback a little, so. Um, so the Shepherd Towner Act um, is the, the closest we come um, in the United States to actually taking some federal responsibility for the well-being of children um, and, and their health from uh, 
to, well, it creates, you get the Federal Children's Bureau. Um, in 1921, Congress passes the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Protection Act. And it's actually a bipartisan bill, and it's going to fund child and maternal health centers working with their state departments of health. And the American Medical Association fights it tooth and nail. They call it socialized medicine. They say the government is getting involved with healthcare where it has no business being. It's also fought by the political right. Um, it's actually um, based in the Department of Labor because part of its brief is to stop child labor. It provides grants to start rural health centers. It's one, um, people looking back at it think that the Federal Children's Bureau and the Shepherd Towner Act and their grants are probably one of the main reasons that infant and child mortality in the African American population and in rural America starts to come down really significantly in the 1920s. But by in 1920, you know, the, the, there are always people fighting it on the right, the American Medical Association, the people who say it's socialized medicine. And in 1929, funding is allowed to lapse. Um, and the idea is that, you know, it's, all of this health care is government interference. Um, the pediatricians get into a fight with the American Medical Association over their opposition to the Federal Children's Bureau. But it's a pretty remarkable group of people who get their chance in those years to try to think about what you can do from the point of view of the government to support um, families and to support child welfare. Yeah, so, so according to the more medical side of things. Um, I know both of us are a few years out of our residency, and you know the idea of institutional memory and how some of these diseases. You know, I, I'm a an ENT, a head and neck surgeon, pediatric head and neck surgeon. So a lot of the diseases you talked about, scarlet fever, diphtheria, those were all airway diseases, and I I can no. only imagine. What what? I was going to say, yes, if there was diphtheria around, we'd be calling you. I, exactly. Well, you know what I was shocked about? And nobody, I don't know if it, there are probably no other surgeons listening in. I'm not sure. But the pediatricians were doing tracheostomies. I would say you're, you're coming into my field. Um, Jacoby did a lot of trachs. I mean, it was that, I didn't realize, um, I didn't realize that. Well, I mean, the thing is, the, trache the tracheotomy then, you know, cut, putting a tube into the airway to keep the, the... So, okay, we should go back. Diphtheria is a bacterial disease. It's caused, caused by a bacterial infection. It, the bacteria makes a poison, a toxin, and the toxin does all kinds of damage in the body. It can affect the heart. It can affect various organs. Um, and one of the things that it does is you get something called a pseudomembrane, a thick membrane-like mass in the throat made up of dead tissue. And especially in children who, as Dana can tell you, have small airways, it can actually, it basically can suffocate you. And before there was anything you could do about this, it was an epidemic disease. It would sometimes sweep through and kill enormous numbers of children in a particular city or town. But it was also an endemic disease. It was always around. It was a disease of childhood. And so Abraham Jacoby, who is you know, often thought of as the founding father of American pediatrics, writes a long treatise on diphtheria in 1880. And I'm going to read you passage from it because it's sort of so heartbreaking. He has started doing these tracheotomies. He started cutting open airways and but he knows that it's a sort of it's it's I think it's it's invasive, it's bloody. This is in the era before he's got reliable anesthesia. I mean it's a real last resort. And what he writes is I cannot refrain from stating that in proportion to the increasing severity of the diphtheritic epidemics, the results of tracheotomy in my hands and in those of others have grown worse and worse. Of 67 tracheotomies, which I published 12 years ago, 
20% recovered. That means he did this on 67 choking children and 80% of them died anyway. Um, about 200 tracheotomies performed by me since that time brought down the percentage of recoveries to such a low figure that only the utter impossibility of witnessing a child's dying from asphyxia has goaded me on to the performance of tracheotomy. So there he is. He's uh, the seat, probably the one of the most senior pediatricians in America, probably one of the people in the world who knows the most about this disease. And he's he's doing these difficult, dangerous surgeries, knowing they're not going to succeed because otherwise he's got to stand there and watch the child choke to death. And of course, the terrible thing in the, in the story that I talk about is three years after he publishes this book, his own son and daughter come down with diphtheria. The daughter recovers, the son dies, neither he nor his wife, who's also a brilliant and heroic physician, they never get over it. And um, I'm just in order to remind you that this is actually a, a overall uh, an uplifting story, I'm going to read you the account of what happens at the scientific meeting um, when uh, in 1894, 11 years after his son dies, they figure out what to do or they take the first step. It's the first great triumph of bacteriology. Bacteriology has been booming since Louis Pasteur in the middle of the 19th century. The Germans in particular, they're identifying and naming one bacteria after another, but it, so far it can't do very much against any specific bacteria. And they, they identify diphtheria, the bacteria, they figure out that it's the toxin which does the damage, and then they figure out how to make an antitoxin an antidote by injecting the toxin into animals, into guinea pigs, then later into horses, and they get an anti-serum, which you can inject into a child with diphtheria. It's, it's tricky, it's hard to figure out how much, sometimes they react badly, but it makes the disease significantly less deadly. And they present the evidence at a scientific meeting in Budapest in 1894. And an American doctor who is in attendance reports, hats were thrown to the ceiling. Grave scientific men arose to their feet and shouted their applause in all the languages of the civilized world. I had never seen and have never seen since such an ovation displayed by an audience of scientific men. And it's the first great triumph of this new science. They've made a, a magic potion. They've created an anti-serum. And for the first time, there's actually something you can do. It's not, it's not what you really need. What you really need is a vaccine so you can prevent it. That's why, that's why you've never been called to intubate or trach a child with diphtheria, because otherwise they would belong to you. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Well, I want to ask one more question that's uplifting, and then I want to turn uh, turn to our audience questions because I've seen some really amazing and important questions. But there's one heroine in your book. You call her Dr. Josephine Baker. She is, forgive the term, a badass. She is so cool. I mean, I cannot believe, I don't know if she, there's been a movie or a novel made about her, but there, you, that's your next book. Can you tell, tell the audience about her? Because she's so cool. She is supremely cool. And I really, you know, I, I found writing this book, I identified with some of the people, especially some of the, some of the women doctors who were training and working in the 19th or early 20th century, but whose story of working with families, working with pediatrics was so familiar. They were preoccupied with so many of the same things that we all think about when we're taking care of babies and taking care of children. So Sarah Josephine Baker, who trains at the end of the 19th century. And I assume that you're thinking of the story that she tells in her memoir where she, when she's relatively new to practice in Boston, she is summoned to deliver a baby. And when she gets there, it's a, it's a tenement and um, everything, everything is a terrible mess. And she realizes that the woman who's in labor has been abused. And then all of a sudden she realizes that um, 
the abusive husband who she thought was out cold with liquor is actually um she says this te this room i thought i already knew something about how filthy a tenement room could be but this was something special particularly in the amount of insect life in one corner was the patient the woman in labor on a heap of straw in another four stunted children too frightened to make any noise the woman said that her husband had burned her by throwing a kettle of scalding water on her. And at that point, the husband himself, who had been lying drunk on the floor, rose to his feet in anger and began to threaten both women, his pregnant wife and the young doctor. Baker ran out into the hallway and the husband followed, waving his fist and cursing. But then, she wrote, as he lurched after me, he crossed the stairhead and with instinctive reaction, I doubled my fist and hit him. It was beautifully timed. I weighed hardly half as much as he, but he was practically incapable of standing up, and this frantic tap of mine was strategically placed. He toppled backwards, struck about a third of the way down the rather long stair, and slid to the bottom with a hideous crash. Then there was absolute silence. I had taken my opportunity, and the result was evident. I went back into the room, pushed a piece of furniture against the closed door, and delivered the baby undisturbed. And then she begins to worry as she's leaving that maybe she's committed murder and her medical career is over. But in fact, as she's leaving, um, he's alive and cursing at her as she as she leaves. She ends up being, she becomes, she becomes interested in public health. She works for the New York Health Department. She becomes the first head in 1912 of New York's office, Bureau of Child Hygiene, which is the first such municipal office in the country, she puts nurses into the school. She loves public health nurses. She works with the visiting nurses from the Henry Street settlement on the Lower East Side, and she sends them into the schools so that they can do something more than just send the children home if they have head lice or skin infections. Um, she's, you know, tremendously interested. She's also, by the way, the person who tracks down typhoid Mary. She's tremendously interested in what you can do to improve the health of the children in meeting families where they are and sending nurses into the home and sending nurses into the schools. Yeah, no, the thing about you're right, you want to learn more about these individuals. So I actually, it's, she, she's quite, quite, quite amazing. Um, at this point, I'd like, because there are so many questions coming in, I really want to turn it over to some of these really important questions. Um, and it looks like one of them is from my, from my wonderful colleague who actually was your resident 20 years ago. Um, she asks, as a pediatric emergency room doctor here on the south side of Chicago, I, feel that, I fear that many of my patients don't feel the reassurance you describe because of the gun violence. Are there lessons to be learned from the successes you've researched that we could apply to the epidemic of violence in our communities? So that's such a great question, because one of the things that I talk about in the book is that as it gets safer to be a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, because so many of the diseases are preventable, we start to see some of the other menaces to children. And some of them, we it turns out, we actually take on and deal with. For example, car crashes. We start to see that, and we know that this is still a cause of tremendous mortality and morbidity um, in young children. You have to, it turns out you have to look at it as a public health issue. You have to think about safety, you have to think about education, but you also have to think about legislation and making the world safer. And so yes, I think I think you know you know I'm a pediatrician. I'm going to say um, we have to look at this as a public health problem and we have to try to solve it not person by person, but on a population level. We have to ask ourselves, how do we make the world safer for everyone? I mean, the biggest message, the biggest message about considering infant and child mortality is that the lesson is never go home and make your own house absolutely safe. If you think you can do that, you won't solve the problem. The lesson is always make the community safe, make the city safe, make the country safe. Think about what it takes to keep all the children safe and your child will also be safer. 
I know that's not a satisfactory answer for something as complicated as gun violence, but I do believe that if we thought about it as a public health issue, if we had money for public health style research into practical fixes into the ways that education and technology and legislation can combine, that we would have a way to begin. Yeah. Yeah. Second question. We know that black mothers and children have higher rates of mortality than their white counterparts today. Do you think that the advances that you discuss in the book initially extend equally to the black community and have since been eroded or that they never reached them in the first place? So the work of figuring out what the historical mortality rates were in the black community is actually, um, it's some of the sort of historical demography that I was most impressed by when I was researching these books and figuring out the numbers. So it's a complicated question because if you go back into the 19th century, after, certainly um, before the Civil War, infant and child mortality among the enslaved population was horrific. It was, you know, compounded by so many different things, by poverty, by maltreatment, by family se um, separation. But in the African-American population in this country, even after the Civil War, after slavery has ended, the infant and child mortality rates in the African-American population were much, much higher than in the white population. So as they come down, and again, the Federal Children's Bureau has a lot to do with this in the beginning of the 20th century, as they come down, in a certain sense, they come down faster in the African-American population because if you're losing um, 300 children out of every thousand, and you come down to a place where you're losing 10 or 12 or 15 out of every thousand, you've saved an enormous number of children. So they come down very dramatically, but the disparities remain. And instead of losing an extra 100 babies for every 100 who die in the white population, you're now losing an extra five or six for every five or six. So the disparities are still there and they're still disgraceful, but the absolute numbers you've decreased. Um, I don't know that that answers your question, but no, I don't think we have any historical evidence that there's ever a point where they're the disparities disappear. I know we'll never be able to know, but if like Shepherd Towner had remained and we continue to count. I mean, it's, I guess we, we can't look backwards and only forwards, but uh, you, you bring up an important question about metrics, and this leads into the next question. Um, now that parents don't have to worry as much about their survival, obviously caveated by what we discussed just now, what would you like to see them focus on most in terms of infant health and development? Uh, and I'd like to add to, to that question, you know, what sort of metrics, since metrics are so important? So I would start with what I said first, which is that I think the, the first task is not only to think about those inequities and about extending these benefits, because I, I, I truly believe that you keep children safer by keeping more children safe, by keeping all children safe. So I think the first thing is to, and you know, the, the first place to think about that, that is vaccines, right? You keep children safe by vaccinating children, vaccinating everyone. You keep everybody safer by thinking not only in terms of I need to keep my child safe, but I need to keep everyone around me safe. Um, you get your flu vaccine or your children get their influenza vaccines, not just to keep themselves safe, but so they don't make somebody who's perhaps more vulnerable sick. And you know that's certainly part of all the conversations we're having today. But the other question is, and this is a big question in pediatrics, and it's really important in the second half of the 20th century, is once parents 
have the sort of emotional space once children are living to grow up. Turns out, and you know, Dana, you can speak to this too, that what parents want is they want to know about development. They want to know about how children learn. They want to know about what they can do as parents. And we get into the kind of work that you do. We get into the question of how can we help parents play from their strengths, play from their position at the center of young children's emotional worlds, and help their children grow up um, with their minds developing and expanding and doing everything that they can do. Do you want to say anything about that, Dana? No, no. I, mean, I, I think that uh, what I... What I do want to say is, how do we harness? Was there ever the sense during the periods that you described that there was a, a collective whole that all parents wanted their children all of them, sort of a collective identity? Or am I sort of overthinking the description? Was there not, or was that not the case? And can we, I, the real reason I ask it is, can we harness? talk about the idea of that when you vaccinate your child, you're not only helping your child, you're helping your whole community, which I hope, I mean, it sounds really, is to harness that even to a greater extent. So it extends to issues of dying from gun violence to, you know, inequities in education. Um, your thoughts about that? I hope so. I think so. I think I think it's something that parents are capable of. You know, I, th I we come back to this question of parenthood. You know, and I know that becoming a parent changes you profoundly and shakes you up in all kinds of ways. I think there's potential. Um, I talk about this a little in the book when I talk about slavery, and I talk about one of the ways that abolitionists, both black and white reached out was to ask women to identify with enslaved mothers and to say, you know, they have the same feelings that you do for your child. And when you look at your child, imagine yourself into this position. And that that seemed to be a way into getting people to think themselves across lines which might otherwise have divided them. Um, I do think that's something that parenthood can do it because it because it makes us all so vulnerable, because it makes us all so anxious, because it reveals all of us as, you know, um, loving other beings more than ourselves. I do think that if you look back at Shepherd Town or if you look back at the progressive movement, you see a moment when people are feeling some community of parenthood and some sense, at which you still see around issues nowadays that children, the infant mortality rate, which was not being calculated in this way till the beginning of the 20th century, very quickly becomes an index as to how a country is doing. Right now, it is nowadays. You know that the infant mortality rate in the United States is not as good. It's not as low as it is in many other wealthy countries. It, be, it very quickly becomes a, a snapshot of how your society, how your country is doing at taking care of its most vulnerable, tiniest citizens. And if we think about it that way, then it becomes a uh, a point of pride for us all if we do well. It's not just a question of, oh, well, my baby's fine. It's a question of how how are we all doing? Have we built the systems that we need? And ultimately, understanding that building the systems that protect people protects all of us. Yeah. And if we've ever been in a position to learn that lesson, we're in that position right now. We're in a position to see how the most vulnerable communities are even more vulnerable in a pandemic, but surely we're also in a situation where we can see how connected we are and how dependent we are on being able to take care of one another. Yeah, well, Stephanie shined a light on that. The, the next question would, uh, of course, add a question to it. Um, comes asks, other than COVID-19, what do you think the biggest public health and uh, public health threat and 
particularly children's health is key. And I'll add that would you put around that in the same way that you have child mortality. Great. So I didn't hear the last thing you said, the biggest public health threat, and what did you add to that? And, and after you define that threat, you know, how would you, is there a measurement that would go along with that, that you would have a nation look at? So if it's literacy, would you have literacy rates be measured? Or so, um, I'd like to think of this in terms of children growing up in sort of not just in physical safety but with the kind and this is you know again something that you know as well as i do with the kind of environment the kind of stimulation the kind of back and forth which allows their brains to flourish and form and connect that's not exactly the same as a public health threat, but I think there are so many different stresses and so many different worries that parents are living with right now and so many different pressures on families, especially right now in a terrible economic downturn that's connected to the pandemic with all of that other stress. And the point of the, my, well, I'm not saying this to say, hey, parents, whatever else you're doing, make sure you do these things for your children. What I'm saying is we need to think as a country and we need to think as, as communities about how we support families in this tremendous endeavor, how we help parents do this really hard job, how we take care of each other so that people can take care of their children so that these early essential relationships can happen. Then we've already talked about gun violence. We've already talked about some of the risks to children growing up. Um, to, it's, to me, it's connected if what we're talking about is safe environments for children to grow and thrive and explore and for parents to feel safe and comfortable. It involves, again, thinking not about how can I make my tight little circle safe. Um, I mean, that's, that's fine if you're, if you're in a quarantine bubble, but it involves thinking about how can I make this whole neighborhood, this whole community safe for everyone. And then it will also be safe and nurturing for my child. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to give a little sh a shout out to your work as uh, head of the National Reach Out and Read. You know, using that public health approach, you're leveraging the pediatric health care visit to show parents, you know, about the power of literacy and language and brain building. So I just had to say that little shout out. But this has been an amazing conversation. There are more questions and I feel terrible that we're not going to be able to uh, go through them. Um, definitely everyone click that link, get a copy of this book. It is um, uplifting um, and you'll want to read more about all the amazing stories. But Carrie, thank you so much for being up in the middle of the night in Italy and um, thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you do and the work that TMW does, which is so important. And thank you for hosting me and reading my book and thinking about it and talking with me about it. It's a, a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining um, and have a wonderful holiday. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.